Hello YouTube! In this video we're going to look at the three methods of charging we use to get our batteries topped up on the boat. And the first is shore power. And in the UK we use these seafoam connectors and it's 230 uh, volts at, alternating at uh, 50 cycles per second. And most of it is delivered to boats using this BS4343, sometimes called a commando socket or a seafoam socket. We should only use the blue one because blue means it's 230 volts and most marina outlets have just the three holes and the plug has three pins. These are rated, uh, these are rated for 16 amps or 3680 watts if you've got a massive super yacht, um, you might end up finding out that you, uh, you have the slightly larger connector, the 32 amp. So I keep a little adapter, that's a 32 amp to uh, 16, in case I end up on a super yacht berth. Uh, I also carry the all important mains tester, and that's very useful for checking that you've actually got power, um, and that it's the socket that's the fault, uh, and not something on your boat. So I've uh, chosen this external cupboard in the cockpit to put the main supply in and there's the seafoam socket and right the other side of that bulkhead is the consumer unit. This is a commonly available garage consumer unit sold at all the usual outlets. It comes with an RCD protection device which compares the current going out against the current coming back in. And if any's gone missing, perhaps because some of it's found its way to earth via a human body, it shuts the power off almost instantly. This consumer unit comes with two circuit breakers, one 32 amp and one 6 amp. Now, fuses are there to protect the cable, and we won't be running 32 amp cable around the boat. Plus, we've only really got 16 amps coming in at best, so we might as well swap this out for a 16 amp MCB. That one will run the inverter charger and directly supply the main circuits when the inverter is switched out. The 6 amp should be enough to run the immersion heater for the hot water tank and I'm going to add another 6 amp to allow a socket for a trickle battery charger for the engine start and perhaps an anti-frost heater which will be useful when the boat's laid up over the winter months. So that's the shore power wired up. Uh, now we go to our primary battery charger and this um, is the Renogy 2000 watt inverter charger so this is an inverter and a charger. An inverter takes 12 volt direct current from the batteries and using clever electronics turns that into 230 volts alternating current for our mains outlets. This being all in one box it has a switch over the speed of which is measured in milliseconds so that we can seamlessly swap between our shore power mains connection and the ship's battery bank. This one allows up to 2000 watts when on batteries, so plenty for almost everything, but when it's on shore power you can get all the power you need from any socket on the boat. It provides its alternating current in a pure sine wave, which means it won't damage sensitive things like your laptop power supply, unlike the slightly cheaper modified sine wave type. A little bit bigger and a little bit heavier uh, than I kind of thought it would be. So mounting it is the <coughs> big challenge we have here. Um, and it's the first sort of consideration. We were going to put it in this cupboard, but the consideration now is that, well, it won't go that way. It won't go this, you know, all the sort of, how do we fit it in? Um, and so we've got to do some modifications to the cupboard to make sure that we've got a really solid base uh, for this to, uh, to, to sit on and all the other components that are going to go in here as well. Using a fairly thick makeup of epoxy, I glued these wooden battens to the fiberglass and then screwed a 6mm plywood sheet to the battens to give me a solid mounting surface. This manages the lithium batteries and like many uh, battery chargers, good quality battery chargers, it has several different stages of charge. Firstly there's the bulk stage which puts a lot of power into the batteries and then once that battery voltage starts to get to a healthy level, um, the machine then decides to reduce the power down but the bottom line is you don't really need to know about that um, you just need to know that it does it because it takes care of it all and it basically what it means is that it, do, it, it, it doesn't overcharge your batteries it, con, uh, it continually manages them by giving them a little trickle charge and it means that they'll last longer. 
Each of the battery controllers and chargers on this system need to be set to match the type of batteries we're using. And that's done in the software. So parameter setting, sorry, parameter setting key. Yeah, and there we go. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, B1, and then we go down BL. When battery voltage reaches 14.74, charging will stop. When battery voltage drops before 12.5, charging will resume. Harnessing the sun's rays to charge your batteries is an essential for off-grid living. I've done a separate video detailing the technology and choices I made for the solar charging, but for this video, suffice to say, I chose a 175 watt, 12 volt, flexible monocrystalline solar panel from Renergy. Installing the panel is the work of moments. This is not its final resting place, but until we get the masts on, it'll do fine for now. And the convenient eye holes means it's straightforward to tie it down to the grab rails. Connection to the panels is made using these robust MC4 weatherproof connectors. The positive uses a female MC4 connector and the negative wire has the male. So you can't get the panel end wrong, but as the controller just takes bare wire connections, you can take solace in the knowledge that if you do wire it round the wrong way, the controller has reverse polarity protection. Adding the controller to the rest of the system is straightforward as well, just mounting the box close to the batteries and terminating two input cables and two output cables. So the, the red wire from the uh, bottom of the controller, these two are supplied with the controller and are both black, which is a bit stupid. Um, the red one and the black one I've put in, so that red one you'll follow here, comes through here and directly onto the battery terminal. Um, and the other one is the power for the shunt there. Um, and th that they are therefore um, before the isolating switch because you want your batteries to be charged continually whilst uh, the sun is shining. The third and final method of putting power into our battery bank is from the engine alternator and for that we use this DC to DC battery charger. When the engine's running, the alternator is needed to recharge the starter battery, just like it does on your car at home. But once it's replenished the starter battery, we might as well use its output to put some juice into the domestic bank. Charging your domestic bank directly off your alternator is of course possible, but the regulator on a standard alternator just gives out one voltage designed to top up a lightly discharged engine starter. But for a deep cycle leisure battery at a depth of discharge around 50%, you need to give a higher absorption or boost voltage designed to put in power quickly. And then once things are topped up, drop the voltage down to a float voltage. This keeps those domestic batteries in tip top condition and extends their overall service life. Lithium batteries are slightly different. They also need a high boost when charging, but they're very sensitive to over voltage and can easily be damaged if they continue to receive power once they're full. The battery's own management circuitry should cut in and regulate the input if it's not happy, but it's really only a protection tool, so it's important to use a lithium charge profile that maintains a minimal or non-existent float charge. A DC to DC battery charger takes the single stage alternator output and provides those two different voltage stages. Connecting up is simple enough. We basically connect to the alternator in parallel to the engine start battery. There's the connections going out, so that's the, uh, the positive and negative. They're going to the battery locally. Um, um, that's where we will connect in the positive and negative from the starter battery. Now, the advice is that the charger should be nearer the uh, domestic battery bank, which, as you can see, is just here. That first connector, the top one, that needs to be connected to the ignition circuit and what well, that's a voltage sensor if there's, if it didn't have that then it would constantly be taking current out of your starter battery then you've got the dip switches here which uh need to be set for lithium and then that's it connected in in summary then we've got the mains power we've got the solar power and we've got the power off the engine alternator all charging our batteries i hope you've enjoyed the video please like and subscribe Thanks for watching.